So good morning. Thank you for everybody being, being here. My name is Manfred Bischoff. I'm the chairman of this uh, session. It's my pleasure to announce the first speaker, Hans Hermann, rather um, well-known and distinguished person in our uh, community and also rather, rather international. He has been many places. He studied uh, physics, but right now he's in, in Zurich, interestingly, at the Institute for Construction Materials. Uh, he has been in Stuttgart for quite some time in, in the uh, area of computational physics, so in my, my university. And, well, on his webpage, uh, he says that he's fun in, in uh, cracking stones and throwing sand. So I don't know what that means for the people in the first rows, but I, I guess you're doing, only doing that on a virtual basis. So without further delay, so we're looking forward to the first talk. Please, Professor Hamann. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers to give me this chance to talk to you here. It's a big pleasure for me. I uh, will talk about some models in the simulation of particles in turbulent fluids. And in particular, I will talk about some applications in which one can simplify the difficulties of the problem. So here you have some examples of situations in which one needs to is study particles in turbulent flow. Like saltation, you might not know what that is, you will know that soon. And aerosols, fluidized beds, plankton concentrations, pneumatic transport in, in industry, and also the knowledge of suspensions. And the red ones are the ones, the applications I will touch here in my talk. Just as an example of what I'm talking about, let me show you just a brief movie of a sandstorm. So you see how here particles, microscopic particles, grains of sand, are moved violently by a turbulent fluid, which is the atmosphere. Um, the theoretical problem is well known to all of you, I guess. I will very fast go through it. So one has, first of all, to solve the flow field, the turbulent one, by solving Navier-Stokes equations, uh, which are then in the turbulent regime for high Reynolds numbers. This can be done by various numerical techniques. This is in the field of CFD. There are many possible fluid solvers to attack turbulent flow, like DNS. Then you have K epsilon models in, in modules in fluent, spectral methods, lattice Boltzmann methods, etc. There are many techniques. I guess there have been talks about that here also. So. This is not the subject of my talk. These techniques I will just use. My subject is how the particles in this fluid are dragged. And in particular, I will deal with problems in which the number of particles is so huge that you are unable to solve the problem in a complete form. I will explain this to you. So this is what, this, these are just techniques that I will use. I will use more, more, several of those. Now, the interesting issue is the coupling between the particles and the fluid. And the easy case, of course, is the case of a spherical particle in a homogeneous velocity field. And this uh, shows you what is the issue. This particle is a wall for the fluid, so it's a moving boundary. The boundary condition is that the fluid velocity on the surface of this moving particle is equal to the surface velocity because you have no jump in the velocity, and so this is a no-slip condition. And so what you have to do is you have to solve the fluid in a very complicated geometry in which the geometry is moving in time, yes? And then you want to know what is the force that this fluid exerts on the particle, the drag force. This force is now the integral over the entire surface of the particle of each vol surface element where you have now a force that acts through shear. This is the dominant part. This is the the stress tensor, and in fact what you have to do is you have to calculate the gradient of the velocity perpendicular to the surface, to the, the gradient of the tangential component of the velocity tangent perpendicular to the surface of the particle. And that one then is going to give you the stress that is acting on that surface element. So that is the task to calculate then the stress, the, the drag force acting on the particle. And uh, this can be done in very specific case, three dimensions in the low Reynolds, in the Reynolds zero case exactly, but this is of course not what we are interested in. We are interested in the high Reynolds 
regime, a turbulent regime. And here we have a formula, an empiric formula that is given in this case for this drag force. We, have don't, we cannot solve this in a closed form. There is the coefficient in front, the so-called drag coefficient, which is obtained in, in, in wind tunnel experiments, for instance, and um, which has this dependence on the Reynolds number. So you see there's here the Stokes regime, which is not of our interest, but of interest is the high Reynolds number regime. And here we have complicated behavior as function of Reynolds number, depending on the detachment of the turbulent boundary layer, etc. So this is all empirical knowledge that can be used in order to simulate better this problem of particles in turbulent flow. Now, uh, there exist other forces besides the ones that, the drag forces, which act from the, let's say, the homogeneous fluid velocity part, uh, while there are other forces like lift forces that come from gradients in velocities or gradients in pressure, and then you have also problems when particles can rotate, you have these Magnus effect, so there exist more complications than just, just what I showed you here. First, uh, concerning only the drag coefficient. Good, and now, uh, to make things even worse, I'm not interested in the behavior of one particle, but many, many particles, and now the problem, of co course, comes up. What happens if you have a situation like, for instance, in the desert, or here uh, in, in, in Brazil, when you have sand dunes that are moved by the wind and you want to study the transport of sand through the wind. And that is going to be the first example that I want to study here. And this is called, this Aeolian sand transport is, uh, is of different kind, but here we are going to discuss the concept of saltation. So what you see here now is uh, a dune in Brazil over which the wind is transporting particles. It's difficult to see really these particles, so we go now to a different movie in which you have a different colored background, and now you can see that these particles seem to be floating above the surface, in fact, at a certain distance. It seems to be like 10 centimeters above surface. This is what you have the feeling what is happening here. This transport mechanism um, is called citation and occurs for grains that are of medium diameter size. So when the particles are too small, then the wind is going to take them off into suspension, and they can travel from one continent to the next. When the particles are too big, let's say larger than, than, than 200 microns diameter, or 100 microns diameter, then, no, 300 microns diameter, then um, they cannot really be levitated. They will stay on the ground, and they move just uh, on the ground. And only in this intermediate range of 100 to 300 microns uh, micro, micro meter diameters, you have this transport mechanism of saltation, which means that the particles jump. Yes, they, for some reason they are dragged upwards and then the wind velocity increases up when you go upwards. So on the ground the velocity is zero and the higher you get, the higher is the wind velocity, so the particles get accelerated and with all this energy they gain, they will impact on the ground, create a splash of new particles, which will then make the trajectories. And at each time, you, in principle, you produce more trajectories if you have a big splash. And there is a point then at which the momentum that the fluid has to give to the particles will be so much that the fluid will be so much weakened that it cannot carry more particles. So there is a balance actually in the momentum exchange and so the limitation on the transportation of particles is given by this balance, by this momentum conservation law. Uh, so to be more precise, now let's go become more, more, let's say, numerical. The velocity increase of the wind going upwards is logarithmic. This is a law which is known since Brantl, since long time. And so uh, in front of this logarithmic, the so ux is now the horizontal component of the velocity of the wind at the height y. This is, sorry, this would be z, so at height z. And then this increases with the logarithm of z times a prefactor, which is called u star, and which is now the measure for the wind strength, for the wind velocity. Since the wind velocity depends on the height, instead of saying I, fix, I measure at a given height, I just 
take the prefecture of the logarithmic law. So this logarithmic law is going to be very useful in the next to do calculations of particles in turbulent flow in this case. So first let me show you a first simplest example what you can do. This is an old calculation. You can treat a numerical wind tunnel influent, which is a, a, a k epsilon model. And there you have a module in which you can put in trajectories of a certain mass and this, the, the, the momentum that these trajectories carry away from the fluid is really taken into account. So there's a feedback effect that I just mentioned. And then you can see if these trajectories will go, are going to increase in time or decrease in time. They will increase if they are too, too light or too little and decrease if they are too heavy. And then you have to find out which is precisely the um, trajectory which will be in steady state, which will neither increase nor decrease. And that is the one that will produce the so-called saturated flux, the flux that you reach when you have this balance in momentum. And in this way, you can calculate now the saturated flux for different initial velocities u star, wind strength u star, and you get a diagram. And you see this interesting result, which at that point was was the first time that it was obtained numerically, that there exists a threshold in wind velocity below which there is no flux. And above that, there is a power, a power law increase in the flux, which goes like a, like a square root. It goes up here. So this is just to show you that such a simple calculation already can give results which are useful. And you can then uh, see also how much momentum is subtracted from the velocity field at each height. So this is the height, this is the momentum loss, and you see of course there is a particular height at which the particles are more often and therefore more loss, and thus this is where you see also on the movie that they seem to be floating above the ground, and this height you can see varies with the wind velocity in a linear way. So if you double the wind velocity, then the layer will be twice as high above ground. So all these results you see are already calculations using just uh, fluid. And the same thing can now be transferred also because you have just numerical parameters to the Mars, for instance. On Mars also there exist dunes and there is transport of, of sand. The sand grains are bigger. So you have the Earth parameters, the Mars parameters. You can just exchange the parameters. There are 10 parameters. And you get, then you get Mars waves, and you can see that also on Mars, you have the same behavior with the flux, except that all the values are different, and you can actually scale everything on top of each other. So this is the nice thing about numerics, that you can then go also to other planets, which is, in practical purposes, not so easy. Now, uh, we would like to go more in depth and study really particles, motions, individual particles, and not just trajectories in fluent. And so what we now do is we take, make discrete element simulations. I guess in the audience everybody knows what that is. And now we have to couple these discrete elements to our, let's say, turbulent flow. And so again, now we are going to use the fact that the, the profile is logarithmic. But of course now we have to understand that depending on where the particles are, this profile is going to be changed. And um, so what we do is we have our drag law that I showed you before, which is now specifically taking a, an empirical law, a fit by Chen, so there many, exist many fits to this drag coefficient that I showed you in the beginning, and this is one of them. And then one uses these uh, discrete element methods with a damping coefficient, you know, this is like a, a restitution coefficients and all that that you all know, I mean, how to, to do that, discrete elements. And now the question is, how can one obtain the correct uh, velocity field, or the yes, correct force, the drag force. And for that, what one can do, what we do is here, we integrate upwards, we start with a zero, and at each uh, layer, at each, we increase uh, from height to height, height, height wise, layer wise, upward, and at each position, at each height, we now calculate what would be the the profile without particles, which would be logarithmic, and then we subtract the shear stress which is exerted by the particles that are exactly flying at that height. And uh, then we have to just integrate upwards and you see here we solve, if we would just put in the constant, then this equation would give me the logarithm, but now if I put in this subtracted, this corrected uh, uh, velocity profile, then I have to uh, get some other uh, deviated, different shape. So this is an iterative process, and in this way I can obtain now the velocity field just by using the fact that it has to increase logarithmically at each place. 
And then I show you, let me show you a movie. So this looks then now like this. This is what you obtain from such a simulation in three dimensions, of course, and you can make it bigger. So you can follow the splashes in detail, and you can actually see also uh, some of the particles fly much, fly much higher, so you know some details of this. So first of all, you can obtain, again, the subtraction of the momentum at each height, how much momentum is, is given or to the particles at each position. And then you now you can look again at the saturated flux as function of the wind velocity. And at this position, now at this time, you don't only find a threshold, but you also find that there is a jump at the threshold. So you see we go more in detail. And in fact, later after this, also experimentally, this jump has been verified. And then this interesting uh, finding is what you can do numerically, you cannot do experimentally. You can switch off the collisions between particles and settle the old question, are these collisions, the mid-air collisions, the collisions of particles in the air, are they important or not? And what one finds is a very interesting result, namely that if one has no collisions, the flux is lower. This is now the flux as a function of the wind velocity. So the flux is lower than if you have collisions. And if the restitution coefficient is smaller, in, it, it, so if the restitution coefficient is one, that means elastic collisions, you have a certain increase. But if you make them now dissipative, the increase in flux increases even more. And so this is very, seems very uh, counter, let's say, intuitive, that dissipation should increase the transport of particles. But this can, of course, numerically now be studied in detail. And what one discovers is that there exist three contributions to the flux. Those particles that are on the ground, which those move, move very little, they're called reptons. Then those that we are the classical ones that, that jump. And then there are particles that we call saltons, which we have numerically seen, which keep jumping on top of those particles that are flying on the air. And therefore, the collisions are very important, otherwise they would not be able to, to fly on top. But since on the high parts, the velocity of the wind is very big, therefore, they get a lot of velocity and, uh, and contribute a lot. Although there are few particles, they contribute a lot to the flux itself. So all these things can be obtained from these simulations. With our, uh, which, we, uh, which cannot be obtained experimentally because it's difficult to switch off the collisions experimentally. Okay, so that is my first example. And now I come to my second examples, which are concerning now inclusion of the temporal fluctuations. All the exam everything I've talked about up to now and most of the things that are done in practical terms concern the average velocity field of the turbulent flow. So one calculates the velocity in, which is averaged over time. And uh, sometimes this makes no sense. In, in particular, you know that there are always these temporal fluctuations which, which have to be taken into account. And so I show here a problem which was an industrial issue. It was a mix in, 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 uh, uh, cement company that wants to avoid mixing two powders they decided to try a new patent in which the mixing is done along the transportation belt. So you have this uh, transportation which is done with, 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 with air. So the particles are transported. If you want, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, hydraulic, hydraulically. And um, now on one hand, the blue particles are put in. On the other hand, the red particles. And the hope is that while they are transported, they will mix. The question is how much time will it take for them to mix? And the velocity field, the average velocity field is trivial in this case. Namely, the particles will all, even in the turbulent case, go just on straight parallel lines. So the average velocity field will not help us explaining turbulence, at, uh, the mixing at all. And so what you need is to include the, the fluctuating, the time fluctuating. So this is the velocity field of the turbulent flow, this is the average velocity, and this is the time fluctuation. And the time fluctuations have to be included somehow. And in order to make life simple, one can include them only because we know already the other part. And so what we now do is, I show you this trick, this is my, the purpose of my talk is to show you tricks how to deal with many, many particles without having to solve the full problem. Yeah? So it is known very well how these Temporal fluctuations of fully developed isotropic homogeneous turbulence work. 
Namely, they have, they can follow the tracers experimentally, and one has found very precise distribution functions for the accelerations and for velocities, which are not Gaussian, so there is not anomalies, but all this is very well known. It's not understood where it comes from, but it's very well known experimentally. And there exists a very interesting piece of work by uh, Reynolds, but not by the Reynolds that you know, by Reynolds in 2003, in which he produces a set of uh, stochastic differential equations of motion for such a traceless, uh, a, a massless tracer in turbulent flow. And these equations are a little difficult. They are, of course, made such that they fulfill Kolmogorov, etc. So I show you them here briefly. So these are three coupled stochastic equations, a differential equation with a lot of parameters on widths of distributions, but they contain all this information that is experimentally known. And so they're just simulating solving these equations, if you want, and then for each equation obtaining the trajectory of one of these tracers, and now attaching this tracer particle to my real particle, which has a mass, now one can give to the real discrete element motion of the discrete element calculation of the particles, one can now add the drag force of the time fluctuations of the turbulent field. And that we did. And now you see here the simulation, you have here uh, the conveyor belt comes in the two powders and uh, they start to have this extra stochastic force they feel which is coming from this turbulent field and you see over a long period of time finally they start to mix and the mixing uh, can be studied uh, of course carefully this we did and one finds that at the end of the day the mixing is diffusive it means that you have a Gaussian distribution which uh, the width of it increases with the uh, time and uh, in a well in known way with a diffusion constant and diffusion constant depends in a continuous way on the Reynolds number, this is now the microscopic uh, Taylor number and this is here the dependence on the density also in a continuous way so one can now simplify things even further and tell to, to the industry don't worry what you have is a diffusive problem we give you the diffusive constant as function of all the parameters and the problem can then be dealt on that level. But what I want to show you is that indeed one did not solve the full velocity field, one just uses this kind of stochastic trick to simplify the problem. And now I come to my last example, <clears throat> which is the preferential concentration in turbulent flow of particles that are in suspension. This is known, for instance, in the distribution of the plankton which is known that there are regions in the ocean which plankton concentrates just because of hydrodynamics, because there is this so-called par par uh, preferential concentration. And so what we do now here, I show you, is a completely different example. As I, showed, I told you, we use different types of solvers. Here we are going to use the Boltzmann, lattice Boltzmann method to solve the fluid. And in this lattice Boltzmann fluid, which is a fluid that is living on a cubic lattice with uh, some vectors. I don't want to discuss that. I think this is uh, maybe also known to most of you. We now introduce uh, an additional forcing term given by, by this expression, which uh, is given by some vector g, which we now have to obtain in such a way as to mimic again the fully developed turbulent flow of the ocean or of the system in which we have these particles. And that can now be done by another trick which I would like to present here, which is due to another person, a uh, very, uh, very good work by Alvelius from the year 1999. And this uh, is now um, a proposal, there exist several ones, of making these uh, velocity fields in this fully developed case by, by telling which are the forces that you need in order to drive this fluid randomly. So it's again a random process, it's like a Monte Carlo process in which you sample the right distribution in the velocities that you have to, in the, in the forces that you have to apply. And in particular, what you have to fulfill, of course, always, it is the condition, is the divergence freeness of the velocity field. This is the, so the divergence freeness of the velocity field imposes certain rule on the fully transformed uh, forcing that you add. So I just briefly show you here, you have this, uh, the Fourier transformation of this forcing is 
made of two components. And each of these components has some prefactor. And these prefactors come on the next page, are given by such expressions. And then you have here these two random numbers, theta 1 and theta 2, that you have to insert. And from there, you generate and, uh, random forces in this way. And it is shown again that these forces then fulfill Kolmogorov scaling, etc., and pre produce all the known features, all the known temporal correlations and temporal um, distributions if of, the, of highly developed turbulence. So you can use that, and I show you, this is now the full uh, model of discrete elements in which one attaches to each particle now uh, two forces, the collision forces and the drag forces, which are given by this expression that I just uh, showed you, by this, uh, by this G, but it is solved by Lattice Boltzmann. And so one solves this, and here I show you an example of this preferential concentration. So have, you generate this moving uh, highly per turbulent field, and uh, you follow the trajectories of the particles, and you see that they concentrate preferentially, and you can now, for instance, study here, but it's not possible to be done experimentally, what is the role of dissipation at these collisions. And one finds that there is a certain dis difference in preferential concentration. I just go briefly through the results, just to show you that there are results, so one can one can quantify preferential concentration by the deviation from a Poisson distribution. So uh, this is uh, like a Poisson distribution. This is what happens for preferential concentration. We have a Poissonian, and the other real distribution is much sharper. And so the degree of preferential concentration can be given by the difference between the um, width that is the real distribution has and the width of the Poisson distribution, which would correspond to it. And the larger this number, the more stronger, let's say, is this concentration effect. And so you can see that you can study how now this concentration effect depends on various parameters. And in particular, the higher, you see this is the, the higher inertia, you get, of course, more preferential concentration. And the higher, uh, yes, the higher density, you get also more preferential concentration. OK, so I think uh, my time is getting over, or I still have some time, uh, gentlemen. It's almost done. Yeah. So I guess the last chapter is, uh, I will jump over because it's a little complicated and uh, I, I think I should stop here. <laughs> so let me give an outlook. So that's, uh, uh, of course, all, everything very simplified and the reality is more complex. We have, of course, particles that are not just spheres. They are more compli complicated particles and they, of course, require more complex drag forces then one has to also include to the drag forces the lift forces and Magnus effects from the rotation of the grains. And then one has to also obtain more complicated boundary conditions. And finally, interesting, this is a talk which, an extra talk, are non-Newtonian rheologies in turbulence. So thank you very much for your interest.